Welcome back. Having outlined the general structure of the verb group in the verb in present day English part one, let us now take a closer look at the classification of the types of verbs within the verb group. Generally, we can draw the following subdivision. We can subdivide the verbs into auxiliary verbs and lexical verbs on the one hand, and then we have further subdivisions. So, let us first of all associate some examples with these four types of verbs. Here they are. For example, do is known as a primary auxiliary verb, could is a secondary auxiliary verb, be is another primary auxiliary, go is of course a full verb, a lexical verb, dance is such a verb, then we have another secondary auxiliary verb, happen to is what some people call a catenative verb, have is a primary auxiliary verb and will finally is another secondary auxiliary verb. The most central distinction can be drawn between auxiliary verbs on the one hand and lexical verbs on the other. There is a set of criteria that help us to distinguish these two central types. These criteria can best be remembered as the NICE criteria because the initial letters N-I-C-E make up this word and in fact here the initial letters stand for particular syntactic contexts such as negation the N, inversion the character I, code or coding the C and emphasis well, that is associated with the character E. Let's look at these four syntactic contexts that distinguish auxiliary verbs from lexical verbs in more detail. Let's start with the N in negation. Negation in present day English generally requires the insertion of the negative particle not into the sentence. So, we have here a sentence structure and generally we would expect that we could insert not, for example, after the verb. However, with this rule, we could generate sentences such as I come not, I go not, he sleeps not, and you know, of course, these sentences are ungrammatical. To build negative sentences, we need an auxiliary verb. So we need this rule where we now insert the negative particle not after the lexical verb but after the auxiliary verb. And now we have a rule S aux not V and we will generate forms such as I may not come, I am not going. Well and what do we do if there is no auxiliary in the corresponding assertive sentence? Well then we insert the dummy auxiliary do to generate structures such as he does not sleep. So negation without auxiliary support is impossible in present day English. Only auxiliary verbs can be combined with a negative particle not. We have a similar situation in the second context, the context that is exhibited by the character I, inversion. Now inversion in present day English that is the formation of questions and also of statements with preposed adverbials. Such structures generally require the flipping of subject and verb. So this is the normal rule. Subject and verb exchange their positions you get verb and subject. However with such a rule you could generate structures like these, come I, go I, sleeps he, and of course you know they're all ungrammatical. So again, we need an auxiliary verb here to get this rule. Subject aux verb becomes aux subject verb. And now we get grammatically correct sentences such as may I come, am I going, and so on and so forth. And again, if there is no auxiliary in the corresponding declarative sentence, we insert the dummy auxiliary do and get structures such as does he sleep. So again, 
Inversion without auxiliary support is impossible in present-day English. Only auxiliary verbs can swap their positions with a subject. The next context is referred to as code or coding. And this is a syntactic operation where a lexical verb is replaced, that is, it is coded by an auxiliary verb. Take this little passage here. Perhaps you should. Here we have the auxiliary verb. But I don't know whether he will. Do you think he must? No, yesterday he did. We have four auxiliary verbs and they could code, for example, a simple verb such as go. Perhaps he should go, but I don't know whether he will go. Do you think he must go? No, yesterday he did go. This is one possibility. Of course, such a coding principle could also code more complex structures such as perhaps he should join the army, but I don't know whether he will join the army. Do you think he must join the army? No, yesterday he did join the army. So coding, again, is a typical property of auxiliary verbs in present-day English, but not of lexical verbs. The final context we have to discuss is the context that is denoted with a character E, namely the emphasis context. In order to emphasize another verb or the state or action denoted by it, several strategies are available. For example, we could use adverbs for reasons of emphasis. Instead of saying I go, we could say I really go or I definitely came. We could, of course, also use intonation. I go, I came. So these are possibilities of placing emphasis on the verb. However, a more common technique is the use of an auxiliary verb. And here we have the examples. I do go, I did come. Thus, emphasis is another central property of auxiliary verbs. And so the nice criteria, negation, inversion, coding and emphasis, they distinguish auxiliary verbs from lexical verbs. Let us now look at the auxiliary verbs in more detail. Auxiliary verbs have a helping function within a sentence. They constitute a close class of words and can be subdivided into primary auxiliaries and secondary auxiliary verbs. Although auxiliary verbs have different functions within the verb group, they have one syntactic function in common. They act as the operator when they occur as the first verb of a finite verb group. Here are some examples. Is is the first element he asking questions. Has he been asking questions? Will he have been asking questions? So in all these sentences we have the operator that is the auxiliary in the first position. Let's now look at the primary auxiliaries and of course as you may know the three verbs be, have and do are the primary auxiliary verbs and they may be used in two ways. They can be used as auxiliary verbs that is in their auxiliary use or they can be used as lexical verbs. Let us look at the auxiliary use first, where they retain only some features of a lexical verb. So, for example, they are inflected for number in their present, day, uh, present tense forms, and so they exhibit subject-verb agreement. He, third person, has third person, he has gone. I, first person, am first person, I am going. Well, then they have past tense forms, had, was, were, did, and so on. But note that there are also other auxiliary verbs such as needed and dared, we will come back to them later, that also have past tense forms. Well, then they can be used as participles, having finished, being hurt. But here we have to be careful. Do is an exception. The form doing exists but it cannot be used as an auxiliary, that is, it cannot not be used with a verbal complement. So the primary auxiliary verbs are morphologically almost as complex as lexical verbs. They exhibit a more or less full inflectional paradigm 
that sometimes is even larger than those of lexical verbs and the classical example is of course be where we have these members be am are is was were being and been so eight members in the inflectional paradigm in special contexts be have and do can also be used as lexical verbs that is in the so-called copula function so let's look at this use in more detail so let's first of all look at some examples here is our typical examples of be have and do in their copula function we are in the garden we have an important match we did our homework the term copula refers to the verb be and copula verbs are those that are functionally equivalent to be however the copula used in sentences other than declaratives is restricted whereas be and have can satisfy the nice context do cannot let's illustrate this using the example of negation we are not in the garden certainly the negative context is adhered to we have not an important match here it works but we did not our homework is ungrammatical and furthermore it's quite interesting to note that con contraction contractions such as aren't haven't etc are impossible in these constructions so we cannot say something like we aren't in the garden we haven't an important match this doesn't work so in acting as main verbs have and be can stand before not in negative sentences they can also appear before the subject in question but again only be and have can occur in such positions here are the examples are we in the garden have we an important match but did we our homework doesn't work so much for the primary auxiliary verbs and their possibility of being used in copular function let's now look at the secondary auxiliary verbs which are opposed to primary auxiliaries they can only function as auxiliary verbs and have no copular function the secondary auxiliary verbs or modal verbs can be grouped into central and marginal secondary auxiliaries or well let's add that verb here modal verbs modals the central ones occur in four pairs where originally in previous periods of the English language these were true present tense past tense pairs for example there's can and could shall, shall and would will and would may and might where for example would was the original past tense form of will an wolde in old English will would today specific modalities make up their meaning that is the degrees of hypotheticality in may and might degrees of willingness in will and would or degrees of ability in can and could here are the marginal modal verbs or secondary auxiliaries need dare ought to and used to modal verbs are often referred to as defective verbs they are restricted for example morphologically they do not form a third person singular cans woods impossible they have no past tense form anymore we should say so would is not the past tense of will anymore because there is a different degree of hypotheticality involved as i said however we could say needed and dared these are forms but need and dare are marginal modal verbs or secondary auxiliaries anyway and they do not have participles such as willing wooding maying mighting etc syntactically there are also restrictions one restriction is that the verbal complement is always a bare infinitive never an infinitive with two modal verbs do not form imperative sentences such as will go might come modals always constitute the first element of the verb group he will well let's mark that he will have been going it's always the first one and finally 
the central modal verbs cannot occur in copula function. It's a little bit different with need and dare, where you can say something like he needs some money, for example, where you would have a copula function. So, let us summarize. Having drawn a distinction between auxiliary verbs and lexical verbs on the basis of the nice criteria where the auxiliary verbs clearly satisfy all nice contexts but the lexical verbs do not. Having drawn this first distinction and having further discussed types of auxiliaries using morphosyntactic restrictions where we say that primary auxiliary verbs are less restricted than secondary auxiliary verbs. What remains is a discussion of lexical verbs. So these verbs over here. And their possibility of being subdivided into full verbs on the one hand and catenative verbs on the other. To do this, however, I invite you to be part of a separate e-lecture which will deal with exactly these aspects. So until then, thanks for your attention and see you again.